Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brandt, President and CEO of AIM Employers Association, and welcome to This Week at Work. Welcome to the only show about the workplace that offers you front row seats and a microphone, bringing you practical, timely, and accurate insights so that you can more effectively lead your organization. It's Thursday, January 12th, episode 213. Today, it's the big reveal. We have a special mystery guest joining the show as we're set to announce one of the featured keynote speakers presenting at AIM's ninth annual leadership conference coming up on May 3rd. Your career will take off when you adapt systems to repeat success like this person has. Plus, Chibs fills in for Bird as the lawyer on the clock, covering the FTC's recent non-compete announcement. And as always, we encourage you to get involved in the show. So speak up, take the poll, and ask your questions now. All this and more on This Week at Work. All right, great to have you all with us once again. Pitching in today for Burt Garland is Tom Chibnall. You all will know him as Chibs. He is one of the fine attorneys over at Ogletree Deacons, a leader in employment law. Tom, take a look in the mirror. What is going on with you today? That looks great. Well, thanks, Phil. I, I, I will say that I haven't gotten that reaction from many people, but I appreciate yours. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it looks a lot better on you than it does Bert. I mean, Bert, he's patchy. He can't grow a beard on his face or nothing, but he keeps trying. You know, he reminds me of like when my son was 17 and trying to grow a beard, but <laughs> that looks really good on you, Tom. Well, thanks. I thought I had to distinguish myself from Bert in some way. This might yeah. be easy to do it. <laughs> well, I think you you got it covered in a lot of ways. One, handsome looks, intelligence. And I can tell by the office there, Bert uses a green screen, right? Uh, and here you have, I, I mean, you're in a real lawyer office doing real lawyering stuff. I mean, those are real files in the background. He's got pictures of bicycles and a water bottle that's been sitting there for three years now that we've been doing this. It's never moved. We know it's a green screen on him. Yeah, right. You, you, what you're seeing right now is what, what it looks like to be a lawyer in all its, in all its excitement. <laughs> well, welcome to welcome back to the program, Tom. We're happy uh, to have you with us. And we do have a special mystery guest that we're going to get to uh, here in a little bit that will be one of our speakers at our upcoming leadership conference on May 3rd. Uh, that was, uh, I believe, registration is open or will be open real soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. All right. So, Tom, you know the, the roles here. We're going to introduce the poll and then we're going to get to lawyer on the clock. So get yourself ready for that. Um, here's our poll that we want to introduce today. Uh, we'd like to get your opinion. Which of these professionals would be the best would be best equipped to lead at your workplace? So these are the professionals you have to choose from one, a doctor or veterinarian, a politician, farmer, fighter pilot or astronaut, teacher, lawyer, sports coach, military general, and police officer or firefighter. Now, the one I don't want to work for is a military general. I'll just put that out there right now. Um, I don't think a general and I would mesh well together. All right. So those are your options. We'd love to hear about it. And within those options is the title of our mystery guest. So please uh, let us know what you think. We'd like to hear your opinions on that. And we are setting up now for Lawyer on the Clock. Tom, are you ready for that? I'm ready, Phil. All right, Chips, here we go. Six minutes, Lawyers on the Clock. You're up. All right. It's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're, you're on, on the, the clock. clock. There you go, Chibs. Yeah. Thanks, Billy. I was going to say uh, your poll speaks to me because uh, before I became a lawyer, I was smart enough to be a teacher. Uh, oh, I'm good. Not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that makes me a better leader or a leader at all, but uh, I got a soft spot for teachers. Uh, but, you know, thanks for giving me the time today and, you know, happy to fill in for Bert here. Uh, some exciting things going on uh, in our world these days in the world of employment law. I know that you and, and Bert had mentioned this and talked a little bit about this last week. And right after you guys talked about it, uh, a lot of stuff happened. So I'm going to bring it up again. And that is uh, some of the issues surrounding non-competes and the enforceability and the prohibitions around them. Um, 
earlier this week, uh, or well, last week, it was Thursday, actually, uh, the Federal Trade uh, Commission released a statement saying that it was going to issue the uh, formal notice of proposed rulemaking in which it was seeking to essentially ban non-competes. <laughs> this is, uh, as you imagine, this is not to be taken lightly. This is something that is far reaching and very broad. Um, you know, some of some of our listeners here might have a little bit of insight into this because they might be in some states where non-competes are prohibited, like California or, um, you know, North Dakota, if, if you're lucky enough to be up there this time of year. North um, Dakota, that's the first time I heard of that. I mean, do people right. work in North Dakota? You know, I think would anyone you, live in North Dakota? I, I tell yeah, you, I don't know. I tell you, if you, I guess if you like winter, that's your place to be. Uh, but yeah, this uh, Federal Trade uh, Commission came out and issued this statement saying that they're going through the proposed rulemaking process. And the rule they're suggesting on adopting is essentially a, a nationwide prohibition on non-competes. Um, so you think about how often we use non-competes. Um, this is far reaching and broad and uh, has a lot of elements to it. But I wanted to explain a little bit about that process so that uh, your listeners know a little bit better what to expect here. The rulemaking process is, is that it's they're in the process of making a rule that requires them to go through a public notice period in which people submit comments. And essentially, the, the agency hears from the public. Here's what's wrong with their proposal. Here's what's right with their proposal and gets an idea if the proposal needs to be tweaked in any way. There will also be a hearing at the end of that period in which people can actually present uh, those thoughts and, and those ideas to the FTC. But at the end of it, it's really the agency who gets to decide, is this going to go into effect or not? And let's say that it does, because usually when you have a proposed rulemaking, the yeah, they're agency, not doing it for fun, are they? Right, right. They're they're doing it for a reason. And so, it, it, Tom, this is is this a little bit like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna share this idea with my workers and maybe get an opinion of them, but my mind's already made up what I'm gonna do. Do you think that's where we're at here? I think that's probably right, and, and it's weird because we've gone through this process before, and you might have remembered it when OSHA went through it with COVID stuff. That's right, um, and and we went through that, and and that's kind of similar. To what's going to happen here as soon as that rule rule goes into effect? the FTC is going to have to give you a compliance period to comply. Part of that compliance under the rule they proposed is that any non-compete that you had already entered into has to be rescinded. So, you know, Phil, you and I had non-competes that we signed 10 years ago. Those would be, uh, those would have to be taken away. So that's part of the rule and that's part of the, the public debate here, but you can very well imagine that there will be many lawsuits filed. Uh, there'll oh, be yeah. litigation. Um, whether or not this ultimately goes through at the end, you know, it remains to be seen. We saw that kind of play out with the COVID stuff and, and OSHA's rulemaking. But here, you know, we might see something similar happen. So this is a big development, something that we're monitoring that, you know, we're, we're keeping a close eye on because it's got a far reaching implications, as you can imagine. Uh, the other thing that I thought about bringing up uh, is somewhat in the news this week was Disney's announcement of going back to work. Four days a week in the office. Yeah. I love it. This is right. This just, this suits me fine. I, everyone on the program knows I'm not a fan from working at home. We do have employees that do it. I comply with it reluctantly. Um, I recognize there are some advantages to it, but I just don't like it. So Disney, like our friend over uh, at Tesla and uh, Twitter and so on are saying, hey, let's get back to the office. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Bob Iger, the CEO, made that announcement saying he's going to ask people to come back to the office four days a week, um, you know, which is it's funny. We're in a position now that that seems sort of radical, <laughs> but it does, yeah, doesn't it? it yeah. In such a short time, it, it just feels yeah. almost unfair to to people that you have to actually go to work and work. Right. Yeah. It's it. And, and, Bill, if you were I having this conversation, you know, three or four years ago, we would have probably been laughed out of the room. <laughs> oh, but, for sure. Yeah, now that's the case. And like you said, you know, there's plenty of benefits to being in the office. You know, I will tell you, here I am in the physical office. I like being here. I like seeing my colleagues. It's a little bit more collaborative. Uh, that's not to say that we couldn't do it remotely. Uh, and we certainly have done that. But uh, be interesting to see how this develops and see how that works out. But more importantly, it's, it's interesting to hear other other companies and how they're reacting to that. Yeah, I think, you know, again, for me, my mantra on this has not really changed. Um, for me, it's really about creating a culture and an environment um, that can be successful. And I know we can be successful working from home and 
and working at a distance and doing things. But if I think back to my career and I think, where did I learn the most? When did I um, have uh, transformation learning occur? That's when I was with other people, hearing what they had to say, listening to the debates, having the debates, uh, engaging in mentoring and leadership uh, activities that you cannot have when you're working from afar. And I think for you know more mature adults like myself who have kind of come through some of that learning curve, I'm always still learning, not to be available to pass that along seems unfair. And for young people who don't recognize what they don't know yet, um, it's very short-sighted. Um, and I think the, the nuts and bolts behind the Disney news is that they're a creative agency. In the end, they do creative work. And most creative artists will say that, you know, creativity comes from the collaboration of, of many uh, and or a team. And, and to be able to be creative and work in isolation at home is really difficult to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree with you. And, and that's what makes the Disney moves make a lot of sense, that the creative aspect that they're cultivating there. I tell you right now that, um, you yeah, know, I find work in the office very valuable. It's a lot easier for me to uh, understand Bert's criticism of my work when he's doing it in person. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's just intimidated by you, Chibs. That's all. He's just intimidated by you. Yeah, no, that's right. But yeah, hey, that's, that's the big news of the week. Let's go back to the non-competes for a minute. So for our listeners, um, at this point, we don't want people to run out and do something um, and, and start pulling non-competes, trying to make changes to them. It, it's, if you're going to invest any time, it's, it's make some comments and get them to the, to the government uh, so that they can hear the comments and the debate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's really nothing, uh, nothing to do at this point um, from an employer's perspective other than to kind of wait and see. If you want to participate in that public notice comment period, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but, you know, you and I both have seen this play out, this story play out before. As soon as that rule goes into effect, there's going to be a, a lawsuit filed asking for a, a temporary and permanent restraining order or an injunction. And we're going to get this. This is going to be something that's settled fairly quickly. And uh, if it's anything like what's happened in the uh, court systems recently, you're going to get one court that says, no, that's not prohibited. One that says yes. And it's going to move itself up the chain of court. Well, let me guess what kind of states those will be in in red or blue, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, we just have to use California as kind of our bellwether state here <laughs> and understand yeah. where that's going. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But I imagine that if it does go through, we're going to have heavy litigation. It's going to be a little bit of a, uh, a stalling process before anybody has to do anything. Um, and, you know, at that point, we should probably have a, a ruling from the Supreme Court even saying, OK, this is this is good. This is bad. And one of the issues that, you know, will come into play here is, you know, does Congress need to be involved? Does this need to be a legislative matter? Has the agency overstepped its authority? Um, and we've seen that story play out recently as well in other matters. But this is going to be a little bit more complex than just putting a rule on paper and saying, OK, everybody's got to follow this. Yep, absolutely. All right, Tom, thank you for being a part of that lawyer on the clock. You made that make a lot of sense to me. We're going to sit and wait and see what happens, and we can make some uh, comments during this public period. I encourage everyone to do that, but non-competes uh, definitely are going to have a different look and feel as we go forward in whatever format they exist in. Let's move on now to my favorite section of the program, which is Filbert's Forum. You've just entered Filbert's Forum, where we peel the onion back and take a lighter look at the workplace. All right. So here we have Philbert's Forum. Today, we got some funny things. And uh, Tom, you and I are going to make as much fun of Bert as we can uh, during this second section of the program. Um, so these are the right and wrong ways to be funny at work. Um, now, I know I'm not very funny at home. My kids tell me that. Um, they encourage me, try not to be funny at work, Dad. You're just going to make a fool of yourself. But one of the right ways here in this first uh, graphic that you'll see is um, you know, affiliate humor with bringing uh, people together through shared experiences. And you all will recognize this photo. It's obvious who that is pushing on the door that says pool. Uh, you know, it looks a little bit like Burt Garland to me. Um, and, you know, that that's probably Burt trying to get into the back door of his house or something like that there. But, you know, one of the right ways is to use affiliative humor um, and make a little bit fun of uh 
shared experiences. A another right way to do this um, would be to, you know, self-enhancing humor, setting others at ease by laughing at yourself uh, in a good nature way. And, you know, sometimes I do that around the house uh, with my dad jokes. It, you know, the, the graphic we have here is I'm not sure how many problems I have because math is one of them. Um, and, and I do hear, I know we have a lot of HR professionals that listen to this program. We make fun of ourselves with math quite often um, because, you know, we picked a profession that usually doesn't um, require lots of math as much as it does the people skills. Um, and actually one of my programs that I I have with uh, talking to the C-suite and speaking the language of the C-suite, we laugh a lot about the math joke uh, and the HR profession and how they kind of go hand in glove. All right, let's look at a few wrong ways here. Um, Chibs, did you like Seinfeld? I did, yes. Yeah. Yes, I hope that's not dating me at all, but yes, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does date us a little bit, but it, it's <laughs> classic enough that most generations still are familiar with it. And it's that self... Uh, defeating humor. And, you know, I think George was excellent at it. Like, like, I don't know, I'm pathetic. And, and the funny thing is, is he wasn't being jokeful at all. He was being serious because he was pathetic. And it was absolutely quite funny. But in the workplace, it probably doesn't do us any good, particularly if we're leaders, um, to be making fun of ourselves. Uh, in that case, we don't have to point out the obvious. Uh, everyone knows you're pathetic if you're pathetic. Um, and then another wrong way here is, um, you know, the aggressive humor. You know, now, Chips, I don't know what kind of environment you grew up in, but I grew up in a very um, tough love environment. I grew up with 13 first cousins that were all males. Um, and this, in my world, was just called tough love. This was not uh, something that was uh, thought of in any way negative. It was going to make you a stronger uh, more confident individual. And I think it did anything but that for some of our family members. But this one is uh, definitely not a, uh, a good way for leaders to try to be funny at work. And I do know um, I've had to deal with several of these scenarios, um, dealing with the leaders and employees and when things get a little bit out of whack and someone says, hey, look, I was just trying to be funny. Um, but nevertheless, not the right way to do it, particularly in today's political politically correct environment. So those are those are some funny right and wrong ways um, to you know to have jokes and be playful at work in this politically correct or incorrect environment. And that is Spielbert's forum for you. And now I'd like to get on to um, the employer's lounge and some poll results. Nick, do you have the poll results from uh, our question today? I do and the well, audience is seeing it and we we have some good oh. stuff. I mean, we have a clear winner, that's for sure. We have a clear winner. That's the sports coach. You think that's got anything to do with – what's the uh, program that's on uh, – Oh, um, Ted Lasso. HBO. Ted Lasso. Yeah, yeah. You think that's got anything to do with that today? I don't know. I think it may have to do with just familiarity because they already are a leader of many. So I think that's kind of a convenient answer there. Yeah, I think if I look back at Philbert's forum and I think about sports coaches, um, a sports coach's humor um, is their what method uh, quite frequently of making fun, calling you out, putting you down. I mean, if you've ever worked for a sports coach, and I, I played college football, I'll qualify that I was a field goal kicker. Um, but nevertheless, um, I was part of the team and in the locker room. And, and if you've ever thought you might want to work for a sports coach, uh, I think you got to maybe get close to a high level coach because they don't worry about the language they use. They don't worry about the, the feelings they hurt. And if you look back at Philbert's forum, it's definitely, definitely going to violate some of the uh, practices there that, that we don't uh, necessarily recommend uh, to be politically correct in today's environment. 30 years ago, I would agree with that. But let's get on to introducing today's guest. He is not a sports coach, but he is definitely a coach. And our guest today is Jack Becker. Jack Becker is a successful, um, decorated, combat-proven F-18 uh, Hornet and Super Hornet carrier fighter pilot. He's decorated and landing signal officer. He oversaw 21,000 mishap-free carrier landings. 
He is a top instructor in crew resource management. This guy has a lot to help us with. He is also going to be one of our keynote speakers at the upcoming conference on May 3rd. Jack, welcome to the morning briefing and welcome to our AIM audience. Good morning, Phil. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, Jack, let's just get started uh, right away. What uh, what inspired you to cross over um, into the business world from uh, being a fighter pilot and an instructor and all the success you were having um, as part of our military force? Well, that's a great question, Phil. It's interesting. When I was starting to conclude my career flying F-18 Hornet supersonic fighter jets, I was just talking to friends in other industries, and I saw a lot of parallels between what my mission was as an instructor pilot, teaching our young guys and girls how to fly and fight in an F-18, and I saw a lot of parallels to the business world and things on just constant improvement and how to learn from each other. And one of the things that I talk about that I'll bring to the conference this May is the wingman mentality. And how much I rely on my wingman more than you could imagine, just the same way I think that you folks in HR rely on each other, because me independently in a single seat F-18 is almost helpless. But me with the wingman, sometimes two, four, eight or 16 wingmen all coming with me is a powerful force to be reckoned with. All right. So, I, you know, Jack, I love when I talk to, to uh, fighter pilots and I've worked for a few in the past and you and I had a little bit of that conversation uh, in the pre-show. Um, and, and I love the fact that it's all about mission. Right. I mean, I, the first thing out of your mouth was the mission. And, you know, we don't use that word so much here um, in the workplace, at least at AIM, you know, the mission. But I mean, that that word very specifically gets everybody focused, the mission. And I have a meeting later this evening. We're having a late uh, planning meeting. It's going to run to about 730. Um, and they're probably listening to the program right now. And they need to get their mind set on what is our mission of that meeting and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so, Jack, uh, tell me a little bit about those helmets behind you there. So behind me, I have my Naval Academy football helmet. Uh, I, too, participate in Division I football, uh, not very much on Saturday afternoons, uh, not a lot of playing time. But the other one is uh, an F-18 pilot helmet that I wore. Uh, this one went through 20 years of flying F-18s with me. Uh, so it's been all over the world, flown on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, so a lot of miles with that helmet, visor, and oxygen mask. Yeah, that's that's kind of like a hockey in St. Louis here. We're big fans of the St. Louis Blues. They're members of ours. I got their their little sign right here. We do a lot of work with them. Of course, they won the Stanley Cup back in 2019. So we'll sure. always be saying that. Um, and that's like the the helmet for the goalie, right? Your fighter helmet. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Helmet. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, Jack. So you know we've all. Um, we all know that uh, it gets, we all get in ruts. Tell us about the thoughts on uh, repeating success and not repeating failures. I know this is something you're going to talk about in the, in the conference. Can you give us um, just a little bit of an example of what you're going to talk about? You bet. That's, uh, that's a great lead in, Phil. The, uh, one of the themes of my keynote that I'll bring to the conference is exactly that, that I say that I'm not going to teach you how to fly an F-18 today, unfortunately, but I will take you on a mission. And the mission I'm going to bring to your conference is exactly that, to repeat your successes and not repeat your failures. And one of the ways we're going to do that is to pool all the knowledge we have from our wingmen, and then we're going to learn what we did best practices. But here's the other thing. We're going to learn from our worst practices from the debrief. And I think this is something that I've shared with so many different organizations in the American workplace, and they're learning a lot from each other. If we can get over the ego of sharing mistakes with each other, for example, if I had a mistake today, you and and we I, don't have any, the egos isn't with us today. He's on, he's <laughs> out, he thinks he's out doing just, something important in trial. And that's our friend, Bert Garland. So we have no egos on the program today. I understand. Yeah. I'm sorry that I missed getting to know him at least virtually today, but that sounded funny. The, the greatest thing is that if you and I are on a mission and I made a mistake that I'm a hundred percent sure that nobody knew I made this mistake, I could easily sweep it under the rug. But if I do it, and I don't share it with you and Chibs, then one of us is doomed to repeat that mistake again. So we come out very forthcoming, and you said tough love. There's things that go on in our debriefs that are very much tough love, but we all learn from each other's best and worst practices, so we keep elevating the performance of the team. My women yeah. all tell me what they did well, 
And I'm going to start doing that tomorrow. They're going to tell me what they messed up. I'm not going to do that tomorrow. And we keep elevating the performance of the team. And that's really how U.S. fighter pilots have become the best in the world at what we do. Absolutely. I got a comment here from our friend Julie online, and she actually uh, picked uh, police slash firefighter. But I think there's some examples in, in that that says, you know, they handle high stress. I would imagine there's a little bit of stress in being a combat fighter pilot, life like life or death stress. Uh, and, you know, they review the big picture. And I think that's what I'm hearing you um, say, you know, in your debrief, you're reviewing the big picture. You're reviewing the big picture and review of the mission before you go out on attack or in a defense role, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, is there a particular process that you use when you go through that, is that something you'll be sharing with us as a process, or is this something that you do as Jack Becker, but other pilots don't do? No, there is a very specific process, and that's a great question, Phil, that it, can't, it comes straight out of our U.S. Top Gun journal. And Top Gun is not just a movie that hopefully everybody saw the new Top Gun Maverick this last summer, but Top Gun is really our Bible for how fighter pilots perform each and every day. And we have a Top Gun journal that I've actually taken and declassified. And I give you at the conference this May, the process that fighter pilots go through of brief, execute, debrief, and perfect. It's that cycle of operation that we use to get better every day. Jack, I have a question here. Are you still uh, an active pilot in the military? I'm not. I retired just a couple of years ago. I hung it out. Uh, my 40-something-year-old frame was was done with flying fighter planes because it's definitely a young person's game. Uh, I did 12 years on active duty and eight years as an instructor pilot for 20 years total flying it, and uh, I have a messed up back and neck to prove it. But uh, I hung up the reserve opportunity as a fighter pilot just a few years ago. Okay, and you also did some um, some instructing as well. And, and can you tell us a little bit about what you did as an instructor? Because that kind of puts you in this teacher coach uh, mentality. Absolutely, it does. And it was an exciting time for me to kind of be passing the torch to the next generation of fighter pilots. My mission was to teach all the wisdom that I had from flying combat missions in the Middle East and teaching these young guys and gals how to fly and fight in the F-18. So it's a little bit of that's a little bit of a motivational speaker's job and teach them the process of how we use the Top Gun Journal. So it was a wonderful time that I had for over a decade of teaching in the F-18 Hornet. Now, in your in, in your intro of the bio, it talks about all your mishap-free landings. Um, so to, the, to me, mishap-free, I'm interpreting that as perfect landings. What does mishap-free landings mean? That's really any landing that we can walk away from or we can use the airplane again. Okay. Like so not, not to say they were perfect, but I instilled this process of brief execute debrief to what we were doing on aircraft carriers. And that used to be considered, according to OSHA, one of the most dangerous feats in the American workplace was landing a supersonic jet on a nuclear powered aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean, both day and night. But now yeah. that we've standardized it with this process, it used to be just kind of cowboy rules out there, and we were crashing airplanes all the time. Now we've standardized it, so we we don't do it perfectly, but we get a little closer to that every day that we do it. Yeah, it's, now, you're, now you're speaking you're speaking Tom's talk there with the OSHA there throwing out throwing yes. that out. Yeah, absolutely. Tom is our OSHA expert uh, out of Ogletree Deacons. He uh, really helps many of our members in that space of uh, safety and OSHA compliance. He does a great job in in, in that space. Um, you know, one of our uh, comments here from Sherry, she, uh, she was talking about a sports coach uh, where they have vision and shared goals, goals. If I took those two words, I'll read her statement. I'm going to replace vision uh, slash shared goals with mission, um, where they have uh, mission and can get their team to play as one unit working to achieve the end goal. That sounds like what you're talking about with your wingmen. Yeah, I think that's a great correlation right there. Because yeah. the, the goals, we we assign goals in every brief, according to the Top Gun matrix, we assign goals on any training mission or even combat mission. What are our goals today? So everybody is aligning that kind of shared mental model to make sure everybody's on the same page of why are we going to strap into these airplanes and blast off an aircraft carrier? What is it that we're doing today? Training or Ab combat? Yeah, absolutely. And I know um, 
And I, I know our guests who join us at the conference on May 3rd are going to hear more about this. Um, and much of what you talk about is, is this statement. It came from uh, Janine. Again, she said, sports coach, but uh, this person would help our people uh, in place, good people, improve their performance. And I know much of what you're going to talk about is continuous improvement. Uh, and in the business world today, with the lack of people and resources and technology enhancements, continuous improvement um, is absolutely a strategic advantage for any business. Uh, and it sounds like your debrief process is all about continuous improvement. That's exactly what it's about. And you'd be surprised, Phil, the number of organizations that I come in and work with, either consulting or giving keynotes, they say, oh, we always capitalize on our best practices. And then I share with them this Top Gun process of doing so. And they said, wow, this opens up a whole can of worms here that we can look into both good and bad. So I'm excited to share it with, with your entire team, because I think we can really excel the performance of everybody individually and collectively, like we said. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jack, we're excited to have you as one of our keynote speakers. I hope maybe you can come back and give us another quick tease uh, before uh, our conference in May uh, as we get to know you and our audience gets to know you. Uh, Chibs, thanks for joining today. I hope you're able to sit in for us next week. In all seriousness, for those who are um, having withdrawals from Bert. Um, go to see a doctor. But anyway, uh, Bert is working on a trial. It's, he's got a very big case going on. And, you know, when these guys get into trial mode, um, that's their focus. And uh, that's one thing I really like about uh, Ogletree and Bert. Um, when they get on their mission, um, they are not going to come away um, in any chance uh, of not succeeding. And Bert is one of the best at that. Tom, we love your new look. You're um, a great friend of the program, and we hope that you'll come back next week and, and help us out as well with Lawyer on the Clock. Jack, thank you for joining us. We'll see you all back here next week at 730 Central Time. Thank you once again for tuning in to This Week at Work. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your colleagues. Forward our invites. Share the link, aimea.org forward slash this week at work, or follow or subscribe wherever you get your news and entertainment, like LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we're everywhere you are. And you can be part of the show. Send your questions and comments anytime to info at thisweek.work. We'll see you next week, 7.30 a.m. Central Time, when we discuss what's happening this week at work.